Long-term carrying capacity on the country is 4,200 DSE. They're a total legitimate operation at the moment. They're currently running 230 cows, 200 calves and 800 heifers. So they're running 12,000 DSE on a place that was traditionally 4,200 DSE. And every DSE day is worth eight cents. So it's a pretty good economic thing. In terms of adaptation and resilience and being able to say, we can comfortably plan ahead till next May with less than average rain from now on. And that's resilience and adaptation. Long-term stocking rate differences here, so what it works out is that um, the difference in the DSE rate between them and their neighbours is about 30 bucks per hectare, okay, which is the cost of all their water and fencing recovered in the first year. That's the return. This is the thing that I thought was most critical. Okay, they've been on the place for eight years. We have made quite an improvement here over the last eight years, but what excites me most is I don't think we've even begun to tap its full potential yet. Okay, and that's been in the last eight years. That hasn't been a fantastic eight years anyway. All right. Unfortunately, the big grazing herds that manage these ecosystems are no longer in existence. We have, they have moved on. What is in existence, however, is managed grazing herds. Okay. So what we see now, in a lot of cases, blinds us to what we could see. What could be there. Okay. That's pretty much it. So in terms of, if the message in terms of adaptation to climate change is you are having to adapt to what you've been dealing with, soil carbon is a massive benefit. Soil carbon is a really simple thing. There was a comment around measurement. Um, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organisation came out recently and said soil carbon is actually very easy to measure and very accurate to measure. What's missing is the protocol to take it from a little scientific process to how do we apply it to 100,000 acres at the back of Longreach. And that's just simply a policy issue. So, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, interesting information uh, and good uh, examples with uh, photos for us to see what it was that you were talking about. We now have a chance to ask Tony some questions around the presentation that he's given, you to, given to you. Is there someone who'd like to start us off with a question? Yes, Jim. Just missed that last bit, Tony. Why can't we measure it out here in um, Longridge? Um, <laughs> the, the difference between... Like, it's not measurement, it's estimation. Okay, so I get a little bit pedantic about the language, but um, when they say soil carbon's difficult to measure, it's as easy to estimate as forest carbon. Okay, so for, the, for example, the only way to measure the amount of carbon that's in a carbon sink forest is to chop it down, burn it and weigh what's left, which sort of defeats the purpose of having a carbon sink forest. So we don't do that. What we do is we estimate the amount of carbon there based on a data set of a lot of information about how certain trees grow in certain ecosystems under certain management. And the reason we've got that information is we wanted to know that so we can chop the tree down and make it into timber. Okay, so there's been a market imperative dragging the science along. The science of soil carbon measurement is very accurate. You can tell much how much soil carbon is here and how much is there. It's a set figure. What's missing is the protocol or the agreed process. What's the proxy or the, the estimation model we use to apply that over broad scale. We could measure how much carbon's on 100,000 acres, but it would be a bloody expensive time-consuming process with a lot of holes. So it's moving from that to what method do we use to estimate accurately enough for a market yet? Yeah. Uh, just, uh, yeah, like how well recognised, like, you know, you, you had some encouraging words there about um, overseas mm -hmm. and IPCC and that's starting to recognise it, so you firmly believe that it will be recognised? Uh, um, I believe it's inevitable that it will be included, okay, it will be acknowledged simply because it's the one of the few things that has a scale and the capacity to actually deal with this thing and has win-win benefits. I mean, we're talking about feeding people, etc. Um, yeah, one third of the world's population is dependent on domesticated ruminants for their very existence. So cattle is not just about feeding the affluent overfed West. It's not just about T-bones for dinner. What it's about for a lot of people is eating out an existence. Okay, so that's the that's policy thing that has to come through. The soil carbon side of things, it's a story that is valid, it's real, it's got a whole lot of positives. To me, it just hasn't been on people's radars. Okay, so if I look at it, the, the language, the shift in the language you had um, under the previous Howard government, it was, it was almost it didn't exist. Okay, and then it became acceptable. You've got the Wentworth Group coming out just recently. You've got a whole lot of um, Al Gore's book. There's, there's a lot of people are talking very positively about regenerative grazing and about soils. It won't be in now, and it shouldn't be in now because for the same sort of reason that agricultural methane shouldn't be in, because we just don't know enough on the numbers. And if it went in now, it would go in at the wrong figure. 
okay? and it would probably have to go on a too low a figure. So it's a case of the great is the enemy of the good. While we're waiting for a great scheme, we don't accept a good scheme. And we also have something in our head that says whatever we get now is what we're stuck with forever, and it's not, it's a step. It's a process on the way through. Yeah, sorry I missed the first part of your talk, Tony, but um, it just with regard to going back to how the good land managers are really missing out on this whole deal, because uh, a lot of the photos you had up there that obviously have great improvement to be yep. made. But so how, how do the good land managers get the best out of this situation? Like, that's my question. It seems that all the way through, um, when they're pointing out, oh, but, but this is what you can get and this is how you can improve and, and all of those. I'm not saying that the good land managers can't improve either, but the margins that are available to them for improvement um, or credits are much, much smaller. Agreed. Agreed. And um, there's a couple of answers to that. I mean, the, the pure economics answer to it is that if we have a fixed amount of revenue to give somewhere, it's far better to encourage changed behaviour than to keep encouraging somebody who's already done what we wanted to do anyway. So, you know, in a pure economic sense, the people who have changed their management have already received sufficient reward for that. That's why they did it. Okay, so that's one thing. We need to kick these ones along. That's a pure economics reason. Um, in a policy reason, the question becomes, how is it going to come in? What's the rules going to be around the averaging of this thing? Um, how much further improvement have you got? So it's a, it's, yeah, it's a little bit like... Um, it's a bit disappointing for the people who have moved, but they should have already received the benefits because they've got a more resilient, more productive, less, less cost-intensive operation now. And then I think, you know, you're looking at it globally, there's a hell of a lot more land that does need to be repaired. And the people who are operating now could possibly take it a step further as well. So. Yeah, it just seems that the, um, the good land managers are getting passed by the wayside and they're not getting rewards. So I'd like to, you know, in the further debate, and as you say, it's all continuing to change mm. and what, what um, scheme they're coming up with isn't set forever. Yeah. Um, there needs to be a bit of a change in that. And the reason I say that is that whilst we're focused on carbon currently, we need not to lose sight of the broader environmental issues. Um, before it was mentioned that um, we should just feedlot all our cattle mm. and, and that may have a great carbon benefit, but what about the wider environmental values like rivers and biodiversity and landscapes and everything else? Do, we've got to be careful we don't let that all go down the tube in the name of carbon. Yeah. And, and also with your photos up there, there mustn't be any kangaroos on those paddocks. <laughs> I'm um, just pointing out that I wasn't the one who said we should feed a lot of all our animals either, but that's a separate issue. So that's that. And again, that's that's looking at it from the carbon side of it. Once you start to take it further than that, it, it's yeah. If you start to torture the detail and anything and lose sight of the big picture, it's bizarre. Um, the, the response to the question before about what we do politically is we get engaged in this process, and and not just shut down, bunker down, and say I hope it all goes away. There are opportunities out there. Um, if we don't get engaged in the process, then you're just going to get railroaded. Okay, and if you look at the conversation this morning, the information that's coming out, the, the science is catching up, the debate's catching up, the, the, the thing's broadening. You've got Nicola Stern came out and said, you know, start off saying everyone should be vegetarian. And then he realised quickly everyone should just be a bit more cautious with their diet, which starts to come back to the broader sector thing. So there's a, a range of agendas being run. Um, you know, the, the city saying, I'd oh, eat less meat. That's one thing. You've then got the McAng McAngus burger, which is double McDonald's throughput of beef. So the people who had a choice have voted with their, their, their wallet and gone and eaten beef. They haven't said, no, I'll not drive my car. They've actually... You know. So you've got to be careful what's in the press and what the reality is actually happening to. Thanks, Tony. Bill? Okay. Up, up, Bill, and then close. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, I can relate very much to those photos up there. I took over the place I'm now with the bank help. I went for the bank. How are you, Bill? Just, uh, just down like this, Bill. So, what, yeah, how are you? Um, I took over the place I'm in now well, I was working for the bank in about 74. Mm -hmm. We had a fantastic wet season in 74, the whole of Queensland did, I think. I was running about 420 head of cattle there then. We had a hell of a lot of grass. 